Hi, everybody. I am Thomas Howard. I'm one of the ICE technical marketing engineers here at Cisco, and I am happy to presenting ICE PX Grid Direct with CMB, CMDBs. Oh, it's so hard to say that sometimes. CMDBs or configuration management databases. So uh, this is a, a feature that we actually introduced in ICE 3.2, but it was done as a controlled introduction. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but these are all the things I want to go through, kind of what is uh, a configuration management database? Why do you need one? Uh, how do we use these custom attributes? And then, of course, the PX Grid Direct feature and how we can connect it to these external databases uh, with things like ServiceNow and other things that you can be doing with it and how you can view that information within ICE. So uh, with that, uh, I want to remind you all that we actually did a previous ICE webinar on ICE user and endpoint custom attributes. So ICE has the ability for you to directly configure custom attributes inside of it. Uh, so there's a whole hour long webinar on that if you want to go check that out. Uh, but just quick review, custom attributes basically are details about all these endpoints that you have. I like to think of it as non-networking information. So more logical, organizational, uh, political type of information that you can use. And the reason why this is important is because uh, a lot of companies have these external databases um, where you keep track of all these different things. And if you were to be the ICE administrator that had to take each and every single one of these and input them manually into ICE with the custom attributes, that would be um, a lot of very tedious work for you. And we don't want that. We want to make this more automated. And so the ability to take these external tables and import this information directly and have some kind of a process associated with it where you have something like a service now, for example, which it's really about processes and how all the different people in the organization have a, a single process for managing the life cycle of endpoints or any asset really. Uh, and so we typically have other databases for this, right? We have Active Directory for doing um, identity and access management, or maybe we have some LDAP databases for that. Uh, maybe we have some other ODBC databases for other information, uh, but there's just lots of different databases out there. And so it'd be great if we could connect to them. So with ICE endpoint custom attributes, uh, we have the ability to do that, but you have to manually create the attributes and you must do it in the GUI. We don't actually have an API for that, but once it is done via the API or via the, the GUI, you're then able to use the ICE endpoint REST API to update those attributes. So it could be automated, but there's a little bit of setup involved there. Uh, and that means you have to basically create a custom application to program the custom attributes inside of ICE. So what ideally we would like to do is use that external process, that external database to do this very same thing. And that's where the configuration management database comes in. Is this, there's, there's lots of different uh, tools out there that do this. Uh, but basically it's a database where we store information about our assets. It doesn't have to be hardware endpoints. It could be anything really, documents, software, whatever it is. Uh, and these are called configuration items or CIs. And if you want to get some examples, right? Like obviously network endpoint hardware, that's what we're here for. Uh, but we may also want to know, well, tell us more about the software running on those hardware devices, right? That's important to know for asset tracking or updates or even vulnerability assessment. Uh, then there's also our networking devices, right? There's there's a life cycle associated with that. We have updates, um, th things like that that we do in terms of their life cycle. And then of course we have different locations where all these things may live and people that own them, right? There's all that political organizational type things we have to think about. So maybe the department or uh, the site where it lives, that may be important to an authorization rule inside of ICE. And then of course there could be other things, like I said, like documentation. So when we think about all the different types of attributes for these things that we, we may care about, these are some examples. So probably one of the most important ones is the unique identifier. This really, think of it like the primary key in the database. How do you want to track it? And usually on a network, we consider that to be the, the MAC address. Hopefully, hopefully it's unique, um, but you may have other things um, such as a serial number um, and even just to generalize it away from the network or uh, vendors and manufacturers, we have sometimes like a system ID or sys ID. That's another type of unique identifier. So then within that, you have all these other things 
that could relate to the location, the department, the the hardware, the software uh, that you may care about. Um, and whenever you do like cloud deployments, you know, you typically want to tag your resources with this idea of some kind of um, uh, environment details like how critical is this to the business or what project is this for, right? There's all these different things that you may want to tag um, your configura configuration item with uh, in these attributes. So uh, the last thing I'll mention is that there's also usually a concept of recency to know when was this asset created in our configuration database and when was it last updated by the owner or whoever um, is responsible for this thing, uh, because that has an impact on its life cycle, right? Because maybe it's new, uh, maybe it has not yet been deployed, maybe it is active, or maybe it's out of operation for maintenance or it's been retired. So all these things can impact the life cycle of the asset or item in the database. And this also could potentially have an impact on the authorization status we want to give it in our network with ICE. So my favorite example of this is actually Cisco IT. They have a device registration capability. We have a we have a tool in-house where you can go and you can register your device. Uh, and it ha they have a process where you go through and you do this, where you specify the device type. You know, what is it you're trying to do with this endpoint? What is the kind of information this endpoint may be sending? Is it confidential? Is it recording audio? Is it recording video? Is it just getting access to the internet? What is this thing doing exactly? Um, and then of course, what is this thing? So they know how to create an exception rule based on the MAC address. And of course they wanna know, by the way, who are you uh, in the company? So that if anything happens <laughs> with this device, uh, you are 100% responsible for it. Uh, and why do you need this? And, and based on that, you know, you agree, and sign your life away and then they will authorize access. So they have this tool where you can register. And this is that process I was telling you about where we can register that MAC address. And I, I used this um, years ago. Uh, I, I had to use this when we were doing uh, road shows for training uh, partners and employees with ICE. I would bring a router that would do NATing for access points plugged into a uh, power over ethernet switch so that all of the um, attendees could use an individual access point to access a uh, ICE in our Cisco demo cloud or D cloud network. And so I had to just basically nat all these, you know, 20 or 30 or more access points through this router with one single MAC address that could not do 802.1x. And so when Cisco IT saw that MAC address plugged into their physical port in a conference room, they want to know what the heck is this thing and who does it belong to and what should we do with it? And so by filling out this, this request form, they knew all this information and they knew, okay, we need to give him internet access so that he can get out to the internet for whatever he's going to be doing out there. So that's basically how, how I used it many, many years ago and how many other customers want to do it. Um, so with that, I want to ask, what kind of CMDBs do you currently have um, that you may want to integrate with ICE? So Rigo's popping up that Slido interface. If you could go into it and go ahead and put that in there. Just type a, whatever the name is. Yeah, so ServiceNow. So, oh boy, look at that Snow ServiceNow. Yep, yep. Karam, that's a new one. Okay, I haven't heard of that one. Churwell, excellent. Sure, we're all acuity. Okay. HPSM, Zendesk, Jira. All right. See, lots of great examples. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Excellent. Okay. Crosstalk, Jira. Okay. Excellent. So this is great. Keep putting those things in there. Um, but I love seeing this. Uh, this really helps us understand what types of examples I could potentially build out. I want to write a document that goes through and tells you how to integrate with some of these things. So this is fantastic. Thank you. All right. So uh, ServiceNow obviously was the number one, right? And that's the kind of the example I like to give uh, because this is what really drove us to do PX Grid Direct. And this is the, the one that we, we first created it with. So the way this works is when you have ServiceNow or any of these other CMDBs that you all just typed in, ideally they have a way to export their tables of information as JSON output. 
And this is an example I, I took uh, from one of our ServiceNow entries. And what's interesting here is you can see there's that MAC address for the network, that unique MAC address, um, or that sysid that I talked about, right? This is um, how ServiceNow tracks it as a primary key in the database. Then you can also see when it was updated. So that tells us if we're, if we're tracking this thing over time that, oh, a single entry has been updated, we need to make sure that we download that update and replicate it to all the ICE PSNs. We'll, 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 we'll get more to that here in a bit. Um, but also look, community group administration. So that could potentially be a group that we associate a user or de device with um, for how we wanna authorize it. We also have things like status, right? If it's operational, let's, let's use it. If for some reason it's retired or out of service or in maintenance, then we should not be letting this thing on the network because according to the, the owner, right? It shouldn't be on the network, it's, it's out of operation. And then we can also do things like segmentation group tags for security group tags with ICE. Uh, we could potentially do VLANs or ACL names or all the above. And we could take all this information and provide it back in an authorization profile. So that is exactly what we did with Cisco PX Grid Direct in ICE. Um, so this feature works not only with ServiceNow, but it will work with any external database that is able to basically uh, export its database tables in a JSON format. Let me show you what that looks like. So ICE is able to retrieve that database table from your database service or CMDB. Uh, we take that JSON, we parse it out, we put it into our database and we replicate it out to all of the ICE nodes, the PSNs. And then it's available not only for authorization, but um, or authentication and authorization rules, but also in the authorization profile that gets returned back to the network device. So we could do, like I said, the VLAN, the SGT, the ACL, uh, even IPSK, that's the one I like to use it for. Uh, so again, this was done in ICE 3.2, but there was one caveat that came with it. Uh, ICE 3.2 and 3.2 patch one are where the feature is still considered a controlled introduction, okay? And if you were to actually look in ICE 3.2, you would see this in the PX Grid Direct, uh, basically the, the page header of the banner. Um, you would see that it's a controlled introduction feature. And so basically what they're doing is they're telling you, look, uh, we think it's cool, we want you to play with it, but there are some things that we know is not available. For example, you weren't able to get context visibility data on any of those uh, resources or endpoint attributes that you imported from that database, right? That was a known issue. We talked about it and said, okay, we're gonna put it out there, let people play with it, but we know that there's more work that needs to be done here. And as well as audit reports whenever uh, whenever the database synchronized, did, was it successful or not? Did it did did we generate an audit report about it? All these kinds of things, um, and so that was considered a controlled introduction. And I tell you this, and I gave you the warning because in three point two patch two, they're providing an update, and it's also in ICE three point three. But there are some issues that are going to happen, and basically, as a result, they are going to delete your existing px grid direct configuration when you upgrade from 3.2 or 3.2 patch 1 to 3.2 patch 2 and 3.3 okay the good news is it will no longer be a controlled introduction so that you you can configure it and feel good that it's a you know fully supported everything should be there for you uh, but just know that if you do play with it you do configure it in 3.2 or 3.2 patch 1 when you upgrade to 3.2 patch 2 or 3.3 it will delete the configuration and then uh, you can reconfigure it and it should be fine. We'll support it from then on out, but just a little detail on that, okay? Uh, with that, I'd really like to show you how to configure this. So what you're seeing here, this may look a little bit different, hopefully it looks quite different for all of you because this is ICE 3.3. I wanted to go ahead and show you what this uh, feature looks like out of the controlled introduction. And so this is ICE 3.3. You're going to notice some very different changes. I'm sure we'll get lots of comments about this in the um, in the the comments um, after this session. Um, but 
I want to show you this and also remind you that Charlie is going to be doing an ICE 3.3 What's New session next month, June 1st. He's going to cover um, all the new features in 3.3, including the GUI. So with that, let's uh, get on to it. So we're going to configure PX Grid Direct Connectors. And I've already configured a couple of them here. So one for IPSK and one for ServiceNow. And what I want to go ahead and do is configure another one. I want to walk you through the whole process, but I pre-configured some. So it has a wizard that we can walk through and basically give it a name. So in this one, I'm going to import a configuration management database with 100,000 entries. This is really just a, a scale test. Uh, we're going to skip the cert validations because I don't have it on my box. And we're going to put a URL in here. The URL we're using is on a box that I have representing my configuration management database. So you can see some of the attributes out here that I created. So this is just totally random data I generated. Um, this, this doesn't mean anything. So don't pay too much attention to the values. But you can see OS, owner information, department, um, network information. There's no IPSK associated with this thing, uh, but we do have the MAC address. And I have 100,000 of these that I randomly generated, okay? Um, so those are some examples of what that looks like. And if I take that URL for my configuration management database um, and I put my authentication credentials, currently only username password is supported, uh, and I go to test my connection, you'll notice that it doesn't work because I'm getting an invalid URL. This is a known bug in ICE 3.3. It's getting fixed, and I need to replace uh, that with a static IP address. And once I do that, then it's able to work. Okay, now it's successful. So it, it can it has a good connection to the CMDB. Now I need to configure my synchronization schedule. So I'm going to pick a time. I did this uh, last night. Uh, you pick a time ahead and make sure you watch your system time zone for when you do it. We're only going to synchronize it once a week. You could do it daily. That's what I recommend is probably on a daily basis. Minimum is 12 hours. So we're going to synchronize it. Um, UTC time, and then you give it a parent object. So when you do the JSON, there's usually a parent object. This one's data in mine. There it is. Okay, so we can see there's that that data we were looking at. Everything's good. Okay, and then let's go ahead and go to the next step. So this is where it shows us all of the columns in that in those database tables, and we have the ability to to choose which one we want. I'm going to go ahead and choose all of them, and then we also have the ability to rename any of the names in that dictionary. So if we don't like something the way it's spelled or it's not descriptive enough, we can change that for our, our needs. So unique identifier, remember I said on a network, that's usually a MAC address. Correlation identifier, same thing, MAC address, and then a version. This basically tells us when was the object last updated so we know if we need to do a refresh on it. Um, so we'll go down, pick that updated time. And next, okay, this is just a, a summary review of everything we're doing. There's all of our attributes. You can see we have a total of 24 attributes we're importing. Um, that's important for our scale discussion we have a little bit later. And we should be done. All right, there it is. So it's out there, but it's not, when I recorded this, um, I did it for the future. So we're not going to see the actual um, updates just yet. It's going to take some time because you always schedule it in advance. Um, the scheduler only has 30 minute increments. So you have to wait like to the next 30 minute increment, which was at the time 2.30 a.m. UTC time. So uh, I'm not going to show it to you just yet, but why, I, don't worry, you will see what it looks like. So we're going to go on to the next thing. And what we're going to do now is I want to show you once that data has been imported, we have the, bil the ability to actually go in and take a look at it as a data dictionary. There it is. So what we're going to do is take a look at, these are all the data dictionaries typically associated with RADIUS. There's that seem to be 100K. So it parsed out all the columns. And those are all the columns of information we have in that. And if we go look, you can see them all over here. There's a total of 24 of them. And those are all the data, the database columns that we imported. Now, if we go look at it for some of the other ones that I already imported, you can see that we also have the IPSK or uh, individual pre-shared key. Uh, this is another one that we're actually going to do a demo with. I'll show you that here in a bit. And then I did another one previously for ServiceNow. So I'm going to scroll down to find ServiceNow or Snow, as we called it. There it is. 
and you can see ServiceNow has a bunch of, a of attributes. If we go look at that data, this one has 103 attributes. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of data in ServiceNow that we could potentially pull from um, some of those things we talked about, right? A lot of really good stuff. So depending upon which ones, you don't have to add them all, but in this case, I just imported all 103 of them. So let's go take a look at context visibility endpoints now. There's a new screen that was added, like I said, is taking it out of controlled introduction to PX Grid Direct Endpoint. So inside of there, you can see we have um, no data yet imported for our CMDB 100K. But if I go look, there's my other ones that I already have imported. This is a real short list, not very big um, for testing IPSKs. But if I click on one of those, you can actually see all of the details that I've imported for, in this case, some IoT devices. I have uh, some Raspberry Pis, that I use for, for different things. If I wanna export that, that data there as JSON, I can do that as well. If I wanna save it for something. Um, so again, here's another Raspberry Pi. Um, you can see I have some IPSK values associated there as well. I also have my snow data, so I can go take a look at that. So there's all those, those snow things. Again, this is all just randomly generated. All right, so that shows you um, how you can view all those attributes now in ICE 3.3. You couldn't previously do that with ICE 3.2 or 3.2 patch 1. So now what I want to do is go take a look at our um, authorization profiles, and I want to show you how we can use that data from the CMDBs. So I've created a IPSK CMDB authorization profile, and the idea here is I want to be able to return an IPSK value um, using radius tunnel from Meraki. Um, that's the IPSK value from the database. So I can actually go through, I can choose the value from that IPSK database from that field and say, whenever we return this, I want you to go pull that value out and stick it here in the, in the response attribute, or I can do it here for a catalyst access point as well with the Cisco AV pair, the PSK equals whatever the value is. So this covers both Meraki and catalyst. I've done previous webinars on how, on how to do this. So. Uh, in this case, in the authorization rule, we're going to check for an IoT uh, SSID. We're going to do MAB on our wireless IoT devices. Our authentication policy is really simple. We're going to just look in our in internal endpoint database. If it's not there yet, that's okay. Keep going. Uh, all we're looking for is attributes to match. And you can see that our rules get kind of squished, so I'm going to minimize that, that uh, menu over there. So now I can see that if something's out of service, meaning it's in maintenance mode or it's been retired, I'm going to go ahead and return that IPSK, but I'm going to say that it's unknown. Uh, in the case of a signage thing, it belongs to the signage department. It's operational. I'm going to put it in the I IoT group. Uh, and the same thing for facilities. I'm going to return that IPSK. And then if there's no match at all, I'm going to permit access, but I'm going to mark it as unknown. So it's segmented out. And... I still have the ability to do profiling and other things on to figure out what this thing is and why it's coming into my network. Maybe somebody forgot about it or uh, who knows why it's, why it's not there. So that kind of gives you the, the, the policy of how you would use those in both the authentic authentication or authorization rules and the authorization profile to respond back to your network device with how this thing should be allowed on the network. Again, you could do this with VLANs, you could do this with, uh, ACLs, you could do this with SGTs, whatever you wanted to return. All right, so what we want to do now is um, I want to go ahead and show you what this looks like if we were to go ahead and authenticate a device. So I'm able to take a look at live logs. I'm actually going to be using a tool called Eat Test. Um, tune into my webinar on Thursday to see how to do radius simulations. Um, this is only for Mac OS. We'll, we'll show you this. So basically, I'm going to be doing MAB against my IoT SSID. I have a username, one of those one of those Raspberry Pis that I was just showing you. There's the MAC address, and we need to have the same uh, MAC address in the username and password field for a successful MAC authentication bypass. So basically, in the calling station ID, we put that same MAC address. We have the NAS calling station ID with the SSID, and that should match on a wireless MAB authentication. Yes, it does. And now if we refresh this page, ta-da, there it is. So you can see we matched on uh, our profile of a Raspberry Pi device. We hit the default rule, which was just to do Mac, Mac auth against internal database. You can see it matched the policy of my signage 
IoT device and it applied the CMDB ISK authorization profile. If we go look at the details, you see there's all the, the profiling details, how it matched in the authorization profile. And we can actually go down and see more details about authorization profile again. Notice the response time, 64 milliseconds. That's very, very, very fast, right? Um, and there is where it's shown that we did lookups on those attributes in the table to do a match. And if we go up, what we want to do is look at this table. So there's a new thing in 3.3 also love this where it breaks down the latency for each and every step right there. That's a really cool feature. I love that. That was a nice Easter egg to find. Um, but you can see how we did a lookup on all those, the status and the department. And for that IPSK value that we were going to apply in the authorization profile. Now this is, this is important because latency is one of the great reasons for using PX Grid Direct. Remember, we take that data, all that JSON, we suck it down into ICE, we replicate it across all the PSN, so it's sitting there local, ready to be used. You don't have to make a network query for it. So if you know, you're concerned about uh, doing dynamic queries in real time over a network, over a WAN, to do a lookup in an ODBC data database or Active Directory or whatever it is, um, this hopefully eliminates that because it's stored locally on the ICE policy service node. So I think that's one of the great advantages. You can really see it there in the response time. Um, typically, if you go to AD or something, it's a couple hundred milliseconds, which is still very fast, uh, but it's that much faster when you use PX Grid Direct because it's local. All right, so the next thing I wanna show you here is Remember how we were importing that uh, that seemed to be of 100,000 endpoints. Um, I want to show you the audit table. So if we go look at the configuration change audit and we scroll down, you can see there's that PX redirect fetch of the 100,000 endpoints from our CMDB. So you can see when it happened and you can see there it is CMDB 100K. Um, we got 100,000 endpoints added. That's exactly what we wanted to see. So if I go back and I look in my PX Grid Direct endpoints in context visibility, my CMDB 100K is there and look at that. It's, oh, it's not 100,000, what's going on? Well, it's still adding them. So I came back and it was taking a while to add them. But if I refresh, you can see that it's still adding them to our, our, our database. Um, I can take a look at it real quick. I'll, I'll come back and show you that. Uh, but I sped, I sped this up for you. You can see those totals increasing. There it is, 100,000. Okay, so now that that's done, uh, let's go ahead. You can see we have 100,000 rows because I generated all that data uh, previously. So now if I go take a look at that endpoint, there's all the data that we imported. So now I could go create a rule um, on any of these attributes. If there's one specifically I want to be able to match, um, I can now do that. So I thought that was really cool, the ability to actually see it dynamically updating, especially when you have really, really large uh, databases, right? Um, so there's that. And then with that, I did want to talk about scale. So for PX Grid Direct Scale, um, currently we have 10 connectors uh, as our maximum. So that should be plenty for now. I think um, if you wanted to do multiple service now or other tables, um, you can totally do that. So 10 different tables. What you saw is me doing um, service now. You also saw me doing, uh, I have my own private um, IPSK file. I'm just putting this out on a, on a server. So it's just a, a, a JSON file I put out. So I can do that one. You also saw me import my CMDB 100K file. Um, so I could do some scale testing. Um, I'm actually have another ICE 3.2 instance I'm doing, uh, I believe I did a million. So I'm gonna try and flip over to that here after this. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Then the other thing to note is if you have a really slow connection between your CMDB and ICE, we have a timeout of two hours for fetching that database update. So if it takes your, your CMDB a long time to generate, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows or whatever, um, and it tr just trickles it down to ice and we do that JSON fetch. Uh, we time out after two hours. Then the other one is currently 
our testing team is saying 500,000 endpoint maximum for each connector. Um, I think we should be able to go much, much higher than that. We just haven't tested it yet. So it's still under test, just be aware. And then they say fewer than 15 to 20 attributes are recommended. But as you saw, when I did my service now update, I had over a hundred, I had 103, right? Um, and so I think there's room to grow. It just hasn't, they haven't had a chance to really test the full scale of this thing yet. So keep an eye on the scale um, on our, our scale page. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to keep testing this as well to see what I can get and, and get our, our test team to document some much, much higher values. Um, I'd like to see on the order of 5 million endpoints um, in there. That would be really nice. And I think obviously over 100, 100 attributes is reasonable because ServiceNow is huge. They have so much data in there. We're probably going to need, you know, 100 or more columns of data. Uh, with that, I also want to do a little comparison just to let you guys know what um, what the different options are. So I talked about the ICE custom attributes. That's the, the, the first column. Um, Active Directory or LDAP is another way you can do similar types of queries with external databases. ODBC is another one. Uh, we also have something called the IPSK Manager, which is an open source project for doing IPSKs and ICE. Basically has its own, again, process where people can log in, update their IPSKs uh, for their individual devices that they manage. Uh, so this is a little comparison in case you're wondering, but obviously PX Grid Direct, um, I think this um, is pretty cool because obviously it's included with ICE. You don't need to go build a separate thing. Um, depending upon how hard it is to work with your with your other administrators who own these other databases, um, hopefully it's pretty easy to get integrated as long as we get a URL to a JSON file. And like I said, I think the, uh, the number of endpoints should be able to to be um, quite large, way more than 500,000. But again, it's under testing. Uh, but I think the real thing that's that, that's awesome is the latency. You just don't have that latency problem, uh, especially if the WAN goes down or something. So uh, there you go. The last thing I want to mention before we get into um, looking at that 1 million endpoints in 3.2 is the REST API. So if you did want to configure this, uh, we have the ability to uh, do this with our REST APIs in 3.2. So I'm, this page is actually on Cisco's uh, developer.cisco.com site. And uh, we also have it built into ICE if you wanna go take a look at it um, from the APIs page. So what I wanna do is let's flip over now and take a look at, uh, so this is what I'm showing you. This is my, my site where I had 100,000 uh, randomly created entries and this is my ICE 3.3 where I configured everything. So if I go and I look at administration, PX Grid Direct, you can see everything that I imported. Now what I wanna do is I wanna go actually look at ICE 3.2 and let's see how it's doing over here. So I actually went and created this CMDB with 1 million entries. And you can see the last time I updated it, it had, four, it had imported 435,000 of them. Let's see how we're doing. One million. All right. So it did import all one million of them. So see, I think there is plenty of room for the scale to increase. I just have to push our test team to authorize it. So um, that's pretty cool. You take a look at it. You can see there's all the, the attributes available to us. And we could then go in, like I said, if we wanted to go create a, a policy, I'm switching between menus now. I'm kind of lost my orientation. It takes a little bit to get used to 3.3 and then to switch back to 3.2. Um, if you do go in to the interface, what you can do is you have the ability to edit it at any time. So you can, do, you know, obviously the, the name can't really change the name, but otherwise you could change the URL. So you can see I imported the 1 million endpoints. Um, the incremental URL is used if it's going to basically go through and it's going to get any updates. So it doesn't have to download the entire uh, 1 million endpoints, it would only update the ones that the, um, the service said had changed since the last time. And then of course, you could always go through and you could change your sync schedule. Um, you could change what dictionary attributes you wanted to include, or if you wanted to change the names, you could do that. 
And same thing with the different identifiers, you could go in and, and change those if you wanted to. So that's the capability that's there. And again, uh, this is ICE 3.2 I'm using. And oh, I did do patch two, so it's got all that capability. Um, this is an early release of patch two. Patch two is not out publicly yet. Um, I installed it so that I could I could kind of show you all this stuff with the um, the context visibility for PX Grid Direct stuff like that. So when it is available, know that you can use it in ICE three two patch two and do all the things I did. And looks like I could go up to a million, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, what else did I want to show you? I think that's that's pretty much about it. Uh, real quick, I will go back into the policy for dictionaries. And if I wanted to see that that dictionary again for the 1 million, if I go down to seem to be 1 million, right, it imported all those. And again, I did just like 24 of those attributes. Yeah, total of 24 attributes, they're all in there. So same thing as I did on the other one, but with 100,000, this one's a million in points. So there you go. Uh, with that, I think we're about done. That's pretty simple uh, feature. I think it's fantastic. This was the most uh, interesting feature, I think, when we talked about it at Cisco Live back in February in Amsterdam. So I think a lot of people, as you saw, have a lot of CMDBs out there. That's why a lot of you are joining today. So if you're interested, um, if there's any questions, Rigo, I would love to try and take some questions on this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Thomas. So let me see here. I do see that we have some outstanding questions here in our panel. The first question is, what if a MAC address uh, is already added via the wireless to the unknown endpoint group? Will that be overwritten or moved to another endpoint group via this connector? Okay, so the thing to remember is that these are just data dictionaries, right? And so what matters is how you write your authorization rules in ICE. So if you have, um, say, your custom endpoint attributes, that's basically a, a data dictionary. If you have uh, multiple of these CMDB table entries, remember 10 connectors, right? You could have up to 10 of these. If you have 10 of these, it really depends on the order. So whichever one you think needs to take precedence, it should be higher up in your authorization rules in your policy for ICE. Perfect, thank you so much. And the last question that we have here before we wrap up, will we get any alarm if the process didn't finish completely and we get the partial import? Yes, you should. If you take a look at that audit log, it should tell you very clearly that you saw when I did it that it was successful. Um, but if it was not successful, you should see that it failed. And it should also tell you, uh, if I go back and take a look, let's just do that right now. Uh, if I go take a look at my audit log, operations, uh, was it reports? That's where it is. Still getting reoriented back to 3.2. Uh, audit change config audit okay so let's see if we're in here probe change config px grid direct connector all right so if we scroll over um connector created so on the other one in 3.3 it showed the number of endpoints added this one it's not i don't know why that was the creation did i skip over where it at? ah the fetch okay here it is fetch success and if i come over here you can see it tells you 1 million endpoints added so if there was a partial add hopefully it would tell you and if you're expecting more um you would you would be able to see that it was not the full number but you can see it's audited here for you to see that it was a fetch operation and that it was a success uh and how many endpoints were actually added Perfect, thank you. And I do see that we have some additional questions come in. Oh, uh, so okay. uh, so hopefully we can address those for, for our audience as well. Yeah. Um, the next question is, how is the attribute conflict handled in ICE when we have multiple connectors? Attribute conflict. So again, I go back to, these are totally separate data dictionaries, right? They are, think of them as separate tables that we can reference. 
And so when you import it, they're just separate tables, like separate spreadsheets or something, right? They don't conflict at all. Uh, I think people think that there's one master database where we view all the endpoint information. So that's actually something we should do. Let's go back into ICE 3.3. And if we look in context visibility and we take a look at my, um, my endpoints, and <clears throat> this is the endpoint that just came in. Uh, it's my Raspberry Pi device, right? We authenticated that. If I go take a look at it, you can see all the different attributes and things here. So if I go look at attributes, um, this, this is general stuff that we know about it. If I had any endpoint custom attributes, that should be here. And then there's other attributes. Um, and this is where we should see um, a combination of, of different things. This should have, um, this is everything ICE knows about it from different uh, protocols or uh, authentication rules, authentication profiles that it hit, where do we get the information from? Um, all this stuff is in here. And then you can also see that when it was queried, it pulled some information, it doesn't tell you, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you which dictionary it came from, uh, but the department I know came from my IPSK dictionary and the status came from my IPSK dictionary. So I think um, you're pointing out a great thing, which is we need to be specific about which dictionary this came from. So I will I will definitely add that as a, uh, a request. But ultimately these are different attributes um, in different tables. So there should be no uh, overriding or trampling of them. They're all, all unique and we can use them in our policies um, at any time. So let me also show you in the policy, if we go look at a policy set, I have my, my wireless IoT MAB policy. Here's my authorization policy. Let me make that go away. So I have the ability to come in here at any time and change these things. So if I, let me just duplicate this above. And if I edit my rules, I have the ability to come in. And if I want to create a new one, I should be able to come down and pull a different dictionary. Um, so my seem to be 100K, I should be able to come in and use attributes from that one. So maybe I care about what building this thing is in, right? And that's, if it's in building one, right? Um, I can pull these separate attributes from separate tables. There's no overriding or trampling of these things. So they're completely unique. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Excellent response. Thank you so much, Thomas. Next question. If we purge the endpoint, should we exclude those that are imported from the CMDB? Um, if you purge the endpoints, you're only purging the operational data. Okay. The endpoints still ex they're still defined in PX Grid Direct. All those tables again they're they're just tables that are sitting there waiting to be referenced. You haven't purged them. If you want to purge them from PX Grid Direct, you need to go into Administration PX Grid Direct Connectors and then you know delete the table. That's how you would delete what the CMD what the CMDB data is so that it's no longer referenceable. Keep in mind, if you did that, um, notice that right here, we have this reference column. It tells you how many times this particular CMDB table has been referenced in the policy. So if you wanted to delete this, let's test, let's test it out right now. I want to get rid of this. Um, you want to proceed? Sure. Not going to work. And the reason is because you must remove the references before it can be deleted, right? So you can't delete it if it's been referenced. So uh, now you got to go back and look at your authorization rules, figure out where it's referenced, delete them, and then you could potentially delete it. But if I were to go do a purge, it's really only purging the, if I did it in context visibility, it would be purging it from here. Um, and if I did the operational data, it would be purging um, all my audit logs, it would purge that and it would purge um, anything in the live logs as well. That's so that's what will be purged. Let's see if I have 24 hours. Yeah, there it is in there. 
Uh, so hopefully that helps answer that question. If there's anything else I didn't quite get, let me know and I'll try to follow up. Sure, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, another the question that we have here is, is there any conditions that can be used to only pull certain endpoints into the local database, or is this the full dump in the CMDB? Okay, again, separate data dictionary. It doesn't override or impact anything in the local ICE database. Um, I think people think that if there's a, a, a commonly named attribute, that it would override that, and that is not happening. So um, the, uh, I don't have, that's a great example. I probably should have thought about making something, if I go look at the endpoints, if we were to look at this endpoint, uh, this one, and take a look at the attributes, you can see everything here. Um, again, department and status, those are the ones that I imported from my IPSK database. If I were to do one like username, for example, right? I think people think that it's gonna overwrite that. It's not going to overwrite it because ICE is getting this. This is from, think of it like the radius dictionary. This is a radius attribute. We can't override the radius attribute because this is what ICE is getting straight from the network device when it makes the authentication request. So that can't be overwritten. Um, and just like the SSID, this is what came in as the called station ID in radius. So even if I have my own radius attribute, my own SSID attribute that I tried to match on in my dictionary, it would be a separate SSID attribute. So I think maybe the confusion here is that we're not specifying which dictionary these attributes are coming from. That is an, that's a great piece of feedback from you guys. So I will make sure that we uh, try to do a better job of specifying which dictionary these things are coming from. All this is coming from radius, by the way. This is all radius information in here. But some of these things are definitely coming from uh, the network as well. So when we do profiling and things like that. So all that's really good information to go take back to our developers to make sure we specify which dictionary these attributes are coming from. Excellent. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, so I think we only have about two questions here remaining uh, that we can okay. address before we wrap up. Yeah. So the next question is, it was mentioned that device deleted an external database would also delete device the device in the ICE database. If that is correct, do we expect many devices could be deleted in ICE if it's not one-to-one, -one, or is it tracking only devices that are added or learned from the connector? Okay, got it. So that's a great discussion point. Let's go back to our PX Red Direct connectors. And what I want to do is talk about when the updates happen. So if we go in here, um, we take a look at the URLs. So there's this incremental URL. I didn't specify it, but what happens is the incremental URL basically goes and checks for updates in that external table and pulls down the updates. The one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't clean out the deleted items. The only way to clean out the deleted items is to do the full database, the full table download from that external database. And that's what this does. And that's why when you specify the schedule, this is the full sync. The full sync means it's gonna basically drop everything locally and re-download the full table so that if there are any deletions, we no longer have those deleted endpoints, right? So that's why the full sync is important uh, to do that on a regular basis to make sure you take care of all the deleted items. Now, what if we had already authenticated deleted items? Those will still be known inside of ICE um, in its context visibility because we've already authenticated them. We've already known about them. That's a historical thing. So that stays in ICE until you either delete the endpoints or you purge the authentication records from the live log. Right, so um, the updates of the deleted items comes from the full sync, and you will still have a record of authenticating those endpoints even after they're deleted from the CMDB until they either age out because your database is full and we you know get rid of the records to make more room, or you do some kind of a purge. Excellent, thank you, Thomas. And our last question here before we wrap up, 
Can we search by CMDB fields in live logs? Search by, oh, that's a good one. Let's go see. Uh, if I go to operation live logs, I don't think you can, unfortunately. Um, and the reason why is if you look down here, I don't think we added anything about CMDB fields. Um, so no, there's no way to do that. Oh, that's a good feature too. I'll have to go add that one. Um, the, if we go into context visibility, I don't think there's a way to do it there either. Um, over here, select all. Um, I don't think we have, let's see. I don't think there's anything identity. No, there's no way to search for that information. Nope, not in there that I can see. So that is interesting. What if, I don't know if we could do an endpoint search up here. And I think this is not going to give us, if we put something like um, uh, signage, that was what my Raspberry Pi was before, right? If we search on, yeah, it's not gonna find an attribute that way. So that's another great suggestion is how do we search for endpoints based on matched attributes? That is not in here today. That's a great one. 